We need to move to our next speaker. So that's going to be Clarissa Franca Diaz Carnero talking about towards best practice in decision enabling preclinical trials. Thanks. Um, okay, so today I'll be talking on behalf of the DECIDE project team, all past and present members are listed here. And uh, the starting point for our project and for this talk is this idea of this translational gap and how promising interventions in preclinical settings fail to show same uh, results in clinical settings. And there are many reasons for this. Uh, yeah, human conditions can be very complex, even when we do understand them, experimental models can be very limited in yeah, uh, modeling this. Um, when they, when, even when we do have good models research, when it's done at the frontiers of knowledge, it's very risky and we don't expect this to be right all the time. Even when it is right, uh, preclinical researchers are not always um, prepared for all the regulatory requirements that will come later before something reaching humans. But um, yeah. On the basis of all of this, there's the point that results may not be trustworthy uh, to begin with, and this is the central focus of our um, project and our initiatives and efforts. There are many reasons for why results may not be trustworthy, and especially when we're talking about uh, limitations in statistical inference, it is important to make a distinction between exploratory and confirmatory preclinical trials. In this context, exploratory research is dealing with uh, an unlimited potential of drugs and targets, and it's focused on developing theories, primarily doing this by larger packages of small experiments. In contrast, confirmatory research is more focused on bringing one intervention to test in humans, and they do this through small packages of large experiments, usually with higher methodological rigor. It was in this context in 2019 that the German Ministry for Research and Education published a call for funding projects on confirmatory preclinical studies and systematic reviews with the goal of strengthening this preclinical evidence base um, to promote more translation of results. Uh, applicants needed to have early evidence from exploratory studies and they need to partner with other laboratories to conduct a multi-center studies. Twelve projects were funded across different areas of medicine, and um, the DECIDE project um, was funded as an accompanying project to this call. So DECIDE meaning decision enabling confirmation of innovative discoveries and exploratory evidence. And there are two primary goals for DECIDE. Uh, in one hand, we provide support measures for these preclinical confirmatory trials in supporting the planning, analysis, and interpretation of the studies, how to uh, deal with uh, animal, obtaining animal permits, and evaluating pre-registration options. Most importantly, we focus on uh, how to specify key decision criteria that will be useful for informing the drug development <coughs> process. Uh, there are also two key meta-research goals, meaning to identify um, challenges and boundary conditions in confirmatory multicenter preclinical studies, and to develop a framework on how these studies can be planned, conducted, analyzed, and evaluated in a way that they are uh, decision-enabling, as the project name calls for. We started the, the project by establishing what's the basis for how we provide the support and how we can then analyze the changes that these uh, confirmatory trials made. What is um, of, uh, I wanted to highlight here is that we find it useful to make a distinction, for example, between external validity and translational validity that may be a little bit different from other fields, meaning that external validity, we're talking about gen generalizability to other preclinical settings, and then we move on to translation of validity as the generalizability to clinical settings because the requirements to achieving both of these generaliz generalizabilities are going to be very different. And then we... Um, established this scheme here that uh, how replications can play a role in improving each of these validities and how other measures besides just simply doing an exact replication can improve, for example, including additional controls or alternative hypotheses that can be concomitant, concomitantly tested. Uh, we do this guidance and the research mostly based on individual consultations with the funded groups, but then we also combine them, gather them in a workshop to see, to get them to talk to each other and identify the key challenges and boundaries for how to conduct these types of studies and beyond experimental design, a topic that really came up uh, 
very prominently was how to deal with the creation of standards of protocols and procedures we're doing uh, preclinical research in multiple laboratories and how to deal with quality control across these laboratories and how to deal with the variation that emerges either naturally or that can be introduced through experimental design choices. Uh, we came up with a list. This is just an example here of some topics that where the minimum requirement, the best practice guidance that we come to are not necessarily new, but uh, what we find very useful is to acknowledge the restrictions that the preclinical setting can have in implementing some of these good research practices in experimental design. This helps to bring the the research is more open to a conversation rather than just saying, no, I cannot do that, uh, this is not relevant to me, and just saying bye. <laughs> um, uh, we move on to further develop a framework for how to deal with external validity. In the preclinical settings, we identify several strategies that have been published, uh, and we just try to organize them in terms of low barrier, like the yellow, uh, strategies highlighted there, the use of heterogeneous models or multi batch designs, and then other more uh, resource intensive um, strategies that add variation to the experiment through different m ways. So, for example, generalizability tests can add variation between experiments, systematic heterogenization strategies adding variation within an experiment, and of course, multi center designs just add variation naturally that emerge from different centers. Um, there were several limitations and challenges in conducting this project. Um, for one, what we expected from the exploratory studies were not very, very frequently met, meaning also reliability, validity and reliability criteria, but also bioavailability and those finding studies that could uh, inform, uh, help the confirmatory st stage to be more straightforward. The registration of in vitro studies was very, very challenging into uh, how we do this and how we talk to the groups about this. Uh, we are also working on um, obtaining some sort of national harmonization in Germany for animal uh, authority permits to also facilitate and make these multi-center studies more common and more easy to conduct. Uh, two other points that we are now currently trying to investigate is how the choices of sample sizes can have an impact on the rates of replication success, depending on the replication success criteria that's used. And also that these studies are usually not focused on a single primary outcome, on a single model, but they usually uh, include evidence from multiple types, including in vitro and in various in vivo models. And there is very little evidence to guide this best practice that we try to establish this framework based on yeah, theoretical considerations, but we believe that developing this unified framework can help do more meta research on the evidence, on gathering evidence for each of these practices. And then after the framework is well established and developed, we need evaluation of how this had an impact on to what extent and what are the limitations of this framework. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, that was great. We have three and a half minutes for questions. So please use the microphones. Yes. So uh, we can wait for the questions from the audience. In the meantime, I, I think I missed how many years you've got the funding for. Four years. Four years. So you are just starting, yes? Or you've been already going for, uh, for a while? Yeah, no, it yeah. started in 2020. 2020. So you are... Almost the end. Yeah. Yes. So uh, do you think this, work, this sort of work will continue and you will get like more funding and... <laughs> <laughs> this is the big question. We, of course, applied for more funding. Uh, the, the project was funded for four years to try to get the, these preclinical projects from their conception to also, after getting the results, during these past four years, we had major disruptions in laboratory activities that were not so possible. So we are working on trying to get some more extension because, yeah, the idea of the project was that at this point we would have some data to analyze, but we don't. So, yeah. How about the feedback from 
participants? Like, would, would they like to continue? Do they see the value? Uh, yes, yes. The, the feedback has been very, very positive that they... Um, yeah, they, they see like, oh, I always heard about these things and we didn't really understand how we could do this or we didn't think that this was applicable to us and how we do exploratory research and how it is important to take this next step to more confirmatory frame of mind in a way to yeah, engage in these other best practices. Hi, Clarissa. Jessica Polka from ASAP Bio. Um, I think the idea of coordinating multi-center studies is really exciting. I'm curious in this environment how um, this regulatory hurdles you're discussing, like is the is the funding agency helpful? Like how is this political? Is there is there political will to overcome these issues, and what is necessary to to make that happen? Yeah, I think the key challenge there is that these are dealt with by different funding agencies, that the ones that fund the preclinical basic research is usually not well connected to the industry requirements. And yeah, we're trying to also talk to them and how uh, other um, initiatives, other funders in other countries have also tried to bridge this gap and provide more industry connections to the funded preclinical researchers. Um, but yeah, this is this is a, definitely a challenge. This is, there is a, in Germany at least this incentive for connecting, having industry partners in their funding calls, like part of the, as part of the project. But I've also, I've also heard of some NIH initiatives that they provide this as an addition, like in kind contributions that they make these meetings with industry partners for the funded project, so that they can. Yeah, understand what kind of evidence they need to bring to industry to get something back. Thank you very much. That was